we are going to focus this very heavily on uh, new construction, substantial renovation, and adaptive reuse projects, uh, affordable housing projects in Virginia. Uh, the focus is on um, what project design teams need to know um, in terms of the housing innovation and energy efficiency requirements. Um, so it's going to be um, just by way of, of overview, it's going to be um, some brief introductory remarks by me and my cause who manages the ASNH program, the Affordable and Special Needs Housing Program. And then we're going to very quickly go into a pretty deep dive on the technical requirements. Um, and we've got two um, outstanding presenters today who are here to be a resource for us on those, on those technical requirements. And I will introduce our presenters here in, in just a moment. Um, so I wanted to also mention that um, I think as I put in the chat, uh, we will have the slides and we'll have the recording available on the Housing Innovations and Energy Efficiency website. Um, so do not fear if you miss part of it or if you have a colleague that wants to um, you know, follow back up and see the presentation, look at the slides, we'll have those available for you um, as soon as we can. Uh, in terms of other staff on the call um, today from DHCD, uh, we have uh, Jennifer Morris, who's our newest team member with the Energy Efficiency Office. Um, thank you, Jennifer. Um, Jennifer is our new technical monitor inspector. Um, she just started with us last week. Um, we are really pleased to have her on board. Aaron Shoemaker is our uh, program administrator for the HIE program. Um, Aaron is kind of behind the scenes running this, this whole webinar for us. Um, we also have Florin Moldovan with the uh, Building Fire Regulations team. Um, so if we have any code issues, we can, we can bring Florin in. Um, we've got Alexis Carey from our communication shop. And then last but not least, we've got uh, Mike Haas, who I mentioned, who manages the uh, Affordable and Special Needs Housing Program. And I also see Amanda Healy on the call. So we, we have, um, yes, we have uh, everyone that we need and I think we're ready to get started. So why don't we just jump right in unless there's anything else that uh, we need to cover. Um, so why don't we move to the next slide, Aaron? So I, I did wanna mention in addition to, I'm sure that everyone's thoughts are with um, the folks who have suffered the impacts of Hurricane Ida um, you know, and certainly our, our thoughts are with, with those folks in those communities. Um, we also wanted to mention at the top uh, of the broadcast here that um, if anyone you know or yourself are having issues in terms of making rent payments, we, we do want to make you aware of the Virginia Rent Relief Program, RRP. Um, you can see the website link there. Um, and you can also, um, you, can, you can dial 211, which is sort of the, uh, the 911 for emergency services or um, community services um, hotline. Um, and you can find out about RRP eligibility um, by doing that as well. So we just know, um, you know, we wanna meet the moment here. Um, we know that there's there's been some issues with the eviction moratorium um, um, being overturned, but we want, to, we want folks to know that rent relief is available to them. And um, our team here at DHCD um, has we have one of the most successful rent relief programs in the country. We've been able to do uh, to get the the dollars out to people, to landlords and to tenants. Um, so please take avail um, take advantage of this opportunity if there's anyone in your in your network that that needs this. So, all right, next slide. Our agenda today: <clears throat> um, welcome and in inter in introductions, which I think we've kind of covered. We're gonna talk a little bit about um, what is REGI, what is the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, what is the HIE program, housing innovations and energy efficiency. Um, Mike Haas is gonna give you a couple updates on, in terms of what's, what's coming up for the Affordable and Special Needs Housing Program. I'm assuming that many on this call are already familiar with the ASNH program. Um, then we're gonna have Jamie Lyons with Newport Partners um, give us a, a deep dive on the new construction uh, requirements um, for high E, which are the, the Department of Energy Zero Energy Ready Homes uh, program. And then we're going to transition to Matt Waring, who's with uh, technical director with Viridian, 
and he's going to walk us through the substantial rehab and adaptive use project requirements for high e and then like i said we probably are not going to have a lot of time for for live q a um, but we'll if you can please put your questions in the chat um, we will make sure that we get to them or follow up with you to make sure your questions are answered so what is high e funding so high e or housing innovations and energy efficiency is dhcd's brand for the regional greenhouse gas initiative or reggie funds that are allocated to dhcd to support um, energy efficiency and affordable housing and reducing energy burdens for low-income virginians this was established uh, by house bill 981 in 2020 uh, we are the major investments we've made to date of the high e funds are in the asnh program and in our what we're calling the weatherization deferral repair program which is a program that we're operating in conjunction with uh, our weatherization assistance program that makes repairs on homes that gets uh, deferrals repaired so that homes can become weatherization eligible or weatherization ready uh, but the focus of today's presentation is on the asnh program and the high e funding that is available through the asnh program next slide um, so i'm not going to read all the slides here but as you can see the regional greenhouse gas initiative is now an 11 state initiative that um, that uh, started with the northeast states and uh, virginia is now the 11th state to join um, and March 3rd, <laughs> March 3rd was the first auction that our um, compliance entities participated in. Um, we've had a, a subsequent auction, which was June 2nd. Got another one coming up on September 8th. And, um, and so that is essentially what um, power producers are required to purchase, as, purchase allowances through the Reggie auctions to um, essentially to um, Get an allowance to emit carbon dioxide and the the basically the, the way that uh, virginia's participation is structured is that over a 10-year period um, carbon emissions will need to come down 30 percent um, and the power producers will have to produce allowances for their carbon emissions um, so that's that's reggie in a nutshell and <clears throat> there are lots of people that have are you know doing PhD dissertations on this and I'm I'm not I can't give you that level of detail but that's generally what um, the regional greenhouse gas initiative is so our objectives for the high e funds are um, looking at deep energy retrofits so looking at uh, going beyond kind of our standard retrofit um, processes for um, existing residential buildings uh, we want to focus on lowest income population benefits, um, long-term energy savings, energy cost savings, reducing energy burdens. Um, we want to incorporate in innovative approaches that overcome traditional barriers um, to building and retrofitting affordable housing at scale. And we want to prioritize long-term sustainability, durability, and occupant health. So again, you know, making sure the, the greenest building that we that we can build is one that we don't have to build. So to the, to the extent that we can preserve and, and protect our affordable housing stock um, through leveraging additional funding, that's, that's certainly what we want to do. Um, so um, I want to give kudos to our uh, stakeholder advisory group. We have a 15 member advisory group that has been uh, representing a number of sectors um, that, as you see here, and then um, we uh, we also we've convened that group seven times and we'll be meeting again um, later this month. And we have two working groups that formed uh, as a part of the, the high E stakeholder advisory group. And one of them is focused on historically economically disadvantaged communities and, and how we do outreach and um, and convey the benefits of energy efficiency. And then we have an energy data work group. And the next slide is to particularly call out um, um, the folks that worked with us on putting together the requirements for the high E, uh, the high additional high E requirements for the ASNH program. And so um, Casey Bliley uh, with Viridian, Jonica Casper, Community Housing Partners, Chelsea Harnish with Virginia Energy Efficiency Council, uh, Sunshine Mathan with Piedmont Housing Alliance, and Adam Stockmaster with TMA Development were really the folks that rolled up their sleeves and, and helped us out in getting this sort of specification ready. Um, we also had support from both Virginia Housing and DMME in that effort. 
So as you can see, um, for those of you who are familiar with the uh, Virginia Housing Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program, um, what we essentially did is, is we keyed off of the, the minimum energy efficiency requirements for the LIHTC program. Um, and then we sort of took it that next incremental step to say, you know, if we provide some additional gap funding for you, um, is, is this reasonable? Can you take it to the next level? Um, and I think we'll talk a little bit about the success that we had with the spring application. Um, and, you know, we're, we're building towards more success um, going forward, but these are the requirements for the high E for new construction, substantial renovation and adaptive reuse. And Jamie and Matt are going to talk about those in, in, in pretty good detail here. So. Uh, so in, additional high, um, in addition to these requirements, there is a green building certification requirement that is the same as the LIHTC program um, requirements. And those are, you know, either LEED certification, Earthcraft Gold, National Green Building Standard, or Enterprise Green Communities. Um, as you, as I think many of you all know, um, as we're building tighter buildings to uh, make them more energy efficient, um, we also have to be particularly mindful of um, maintaining, um, you know, relative indoor humidity at a, at a good um, place. Um, so, you know, that dehumidification piece is critical. Um, and then for the substantial renovation and adaptive reuse projects, we have some additional requirements built in here that um, sort of cover the issue of uh, fresh air ventilation if the building is tightened up to new construction standards as a part of the renovation. Yeah. <laughs> uh, those pesky restart messages. Um, and then if we have a situation where we want the existing duct work, if that's going to be left in place, um, that needs to be sort of brought up to a reasonable standard and we, um, you know, the group determined that um, about less than 10% of total duct leakage was a reasonable um, standard to hit there. Um, if it's going to be newly installed um, HVAC system and duct work, then it will need to meet the new construction requirements of uh, less than 4% of total duct leakage. So, all right, uh, we are flying right along here and folks are still joining. Um, so. For those of you that joined us in progress, um, as I mentioned in the chat here, um, we will have a recording and we'll have the slide presentations um, available to you. Um, well, they'll be distributed to you and they'll be posted on the HIE e webpage. So um, this is the, I think the last slide I'm gonna do for right now. Um, so in terms of the, the, require, the documentation requirements for your affordable and special needs housing application for HIE. e um, what we're looking for is the preliminary rating from the HERS rater on a representative sample of units um, showing the zero energy ready homes compliance for new construction, uh, the HERS 70 target for substantial rehab or the 40% improvement in HERS index if that's the pathway that you'll be using for the substantial renovation project. Um, then for adaptive reuse, um, again, we're, we're looking for a HERS 80. Um, across the um, average across the units, um, which is again, is 15% is better than what um, Virginia housing requires the 95 for the LIHTC projects. Um, we wanna see the green building certification checklist, um, understanding that maybe preliminary in terms of the, uh, the projects is still in the design phase. Um, we'd like to see a narrative describing how the project team will achieve the high E performance requirements um, across the building system and dwelling units. Um, so it doesn't have to be um, at an excruciating level of detail, but again, you know, a, a page or so describing what your approach is gonna be um, is, is really helpful. Um, and then to the extent feasible, um, if you can provide in, incremental cost information in terms of, um, you know, what your project team is encountering in terms of additional incremental costs to meet the high E requirements, uh, we, um, Greatly appreciate that information and we will keep it confidential. Um, we won't, you know, we may share that information in a generalized fashion, but we will not share it specifically with regard to your project. So if you share that with DHCD, um, you can trust that we, you know, we're, we'll take that in confidence. All right, I'm going to switch it over to Mike Haas um, and Mike's going to give you some updates on the affordable and special needs housing 
Hey, good afternoon. Thanks, Dan. Um, so just to kind of summarize the high E funds thus far through the program. Um, so as many of you know, and some of you came in for funding in last April, our last affordable and special needs housing round, um, we had 7.2 million in high E funds requested um, across about 14 projects. We had a total of 8.7 million available. Um, of those projects that came in, we were able to award 11 projects. Um, so about 5.96 million high E funds were obligated, um, totaling to about 700 dwelling units to be preserved or produced and that would meet the high E requirements. Um, our next upcoming round, and there'll be a little bit more information on this later, is October 2021. Uh, for this round, we envision having 27 million available on high E. Uh, that will include, of course, 60% of the June 2nd proceeds and projected September 8th proceeds, um, plus the additional 2 million carryover from the spring round. Uh, some just general information on the affordable and special needs housing program. So right now we have on our schedule, the how to apply webinar will be September 14th from 1 to 3 p.m. A invite will be going out shortly within the next day or two with the meeting details. Um, for those of you who have not been on that before, um, generally speaking, it's a walkthrough of the affordable and special needs housing application um, in which we discuss the program, go over any changes um, that may be going through with the program in the upcoming year. Um, and also, we give some detail on the traditional funding sources, which have been the Home National Housing Trust Fund, Virginia Housing Trust Fund, and Permanent Supportive Housing um, pot of funds. So our anticipated um, amount for the next fall 2020 round, really the next year, is 84 million. Uh, for those of you who've been through it, you know that we half that amount for each round, so we have two rounds, it's a biannual application. We have an October round, which we're discussing here, and then we have a spring round tentatively set for March 31st. That equals out to about $42 million per round. Um, and then just important to note that for, in order for a project to receive a high award, it must score and be funded with a traditional source of affordable and special needs housing. So you must either gain a Virginia Housing Trust Fund, National Housing Trust Fund, or Home Award in order to open up access to the high E funding. And there'll be more information to come out in September 14th, so stay tuned. Great, thank you, Mike. Um, so let's, let's um, get into the presentations today. Uh, pl remember, please uh, go ahead and put your questions in the chat so that we can make sure that we cover them. If we don't get to them today, we'll follow up with you and make sure that we do get that information out to you. Um, but I'm very pleased to introduce our two presenters today, uh, Jamie Lyons with Newport Partners. Uh, Jamie is the, the uh, Jamie's company, Newport Partners, is the, um, is, is the um, implementation contractor for the U.S. Department of Energy for the Zero Energy Ready Homes Program. And in this role, he serves as the technical director um, supporting builders, raters, architects, um, building owners, <clears throat> and utilities to help them achieve solutions for high performance homes and buildings. He's a professional engineer in the state of Maryland. Um, also joining us today is Matt Waring, who's the technical director for Viridians. Uh, Matt's been working in the construction field for more than a decade. Um, he has experience as a supervisor for both single family and multi multifamily construction projects in Virginia and South Carolina. Uh, Matt has served in several roles for Viridian uh, over the years. He is now on the technical management team overseeing Viridian's technical advisors and project managers, um, working with a broad of, array of clients. Um, he's been a certified home energy rater since 2011. Um, so, Jamie, I hope you got your auctioneer's voice uh, limbered up, <laughs> and uh, we'll turn it over to you. All right, let's get it rolling here, Dan. Teeing up my screen. Hopefully you can see it here. And how are we looking, Dan? We good? We have slides. All right. Let's ch jump right in. Thanks, everybody, for spending part of your day with us. Time is a bit tight, so I'm going to jump right in. And our goal here today over the next few minutes is to unpack 
the basics of what's required to meet the program specs for the zero energy ready home program that's referenced in the high e uh, program that dan was just uh, describing so normally this could be a much more expansive talk but we're going to drill down into uh, sort of the core nuggets here for today's session so we start off with eligible building types those are listed here a uh, single family multifamily up to five stories and there's some uh, limitations on how much uh, space must be the residential space in the, in those buildings and some of you might be wondering okay what's the interplay with energy star multifamily new construction since multifamily pro projects now in virginia uh, will go through that element of the energy star program and there's a couple key points to note on that uh, first off is that DOE Zero Energy Ready requires Energy Star as a prerequisite. It could be Energy Star Homes, or it could be Energy Star Multifamily New Construction if that's the appropriate Energy Star labeling program. So I wanted to note that. And then a second quick item is looking out over the horizon uh, about a year, year and a half from now. Uh, the Zero Ready program is also formulating a multifamily version of the Zero Ready program that'll have the same look and feel as Energy Star Multifamily New Construction. We're not there today, so the, the specs that I'll be describing here today are the current specs that would be appropriate for use in, in this year's high e program. But just wanted to share what's out over the horizon a little bit. So we unpack the zero ready specs really using the stair step diagram because many, if not most of our builder and developer partners are they're already building to energy star. So a natural question is, well, what do I have to do above and beyond Energy Star? So that's how I'll frame uh, the discussion around the program requirements today for zero energy ready home. And we'll start off with that first item. It's the HERS index. I like to call that sort of the measuring stick for the dwelling's efficiency. Lower is better, just like golf. And it's not a one size fits all score. It's determined by the rating software, which the energy rater involved with the project will, will be using. But generally, if you're just kicking the tires and want to know, okay, what range uh, would a project need to fall in, you could see for Climate Zone 4, which is the Virginia uh, area, you'd be in the mid-50s. So how efficient is that? Well, it's pretty efficient, but this is industry data from ResNet for last year, and there's you know, almost 300,000 ratings, and the average HERS rating out there is a 58. So there's lots and lots of dwelling units and homes uh, already in this neighborhood of the required HERS index for zero ready. So it might take a little work to get to that index, uh, but it's very, very attainable. Next item we'll look at is the building enclosure. This is a big, important element to DOE because that enclosure is sort of locked in for the long haul. Uh, it makes the, the dwelling unit uh, more uh, more demand flexible over time if, if it's going to be participating in utility programs, things like that. So it's, this is a must have. It's a mandatory item that the building envelope has to be at least as good as, as an envelope built to the 2015 IECC. So the specs for that are shown here on this slide. These are pretty good uh, assemblies, but again, very attainable. We don't typically see partners have a lot of difficulty attaining these levels. And you don't have to do each and every one of these levels. There can be a, a trade-off approach, again, which uh, would be done by the modeling software through the assistance of an energy rater. Hey, Jamie, this is Dan. I'm sorry to break in. Uh, can you hide your stop sharing thing? Is that on your end? Oh, yeah, hide it. Sorry. Yeah, because yeah, you're covering up some yeah. content. Thank you. Thank part you. of the slide. Yep. As for the windows, uh, we see what's required here for climate zone four. Uh, the windows have to be at least as good as the uh, 0.30 U factor and a solar heat gain of, of 0.4. Again, that's a good window, but very, very attainable for projects. The next three items we sort of just checked uh, en masse. And the reason for that is that independent verification water management and quality installed HVAC with whole house ventilation. All three of those are uh, embedded within the Energy Star program. So by virtue of doing Energy Star, we're getting all those, those key elements. Uh, I could expound on why these are beneficial and good. Uh, there's very good reasons they're built in. Uh, but for the zero ready perspective, uh, we're getting these through the Energy Star prerequisite. So I won't spend a lot of time on them. 
I, I really do like to point out though the value of a third party uh, independent verifier, the Raider. It just adds an element of a second set of eyes looking at things, the plan review, the energy modeling, the on-site inspections. Uh, I've talked to many, many of our partners over the years and they find a lot of value in a reliable Raider that helps, helps uh, deliver the intended outcomes for the projects. Next item I'll mention uh, for Zero Ready, you can see we're starting to climb up the, the ladder above and beyond uh, what Energy Star would, would provide uh, is the optimized duct location. Just a real quick example of why uh, we focus on the thermal distribution system. Uh, you know, which house would you rather live in here? Uh, the one on the left with a very high efficiency furnace, but a mediocre duct system, or the one on the right, which is sort of the reverse. And if you're quick at the math, you could see, well, the system on the right, even though that furnace isn't anything special, uh, overall, you'll get more energy out of that system relative to what you put into it because it's a very efficient duct system. Uh, in reality, zero energy ready homes are going to have high efficiency HVAC as well as a good duct system, so you get the best of both worlds. Uh, but the duct systems are a key element because, again, they're, they're sort of built into the dwelling and the home. They're going to be there most likely for the life cycle of the unit, so it's important to get them in a good location. So within the zero ready specs, uh, there's a sort of a, a toolkit of different uh, location options where the duct systems can be located. Uh, and, and those are uh, those are visualized here with some of these uh, graphics and they're spelled out in a bit more detail in our specifications. So the, the takeaway here is keep in mind that the duct system needs to be uh, designed such that it's not located in a totally uh, unconditioned uh, severe space like an attic. And the same goes for the HVAC unit itself. Next item we'll touch on is the EPA Indoor Air Plus certification. Uh, I think Dan mentioned in his opening remarks the importance of not just the energy efficiency of affordable housing, but also the, the healthy indoor environments. And our program uh, believes very, very strongly in that, that it's efficiency, but it's also performance. And the indoor air quality element of that performance is delivered to our program by projects complying with Indoor Air Plus. You can see here that just by being part of an Energy Star program, uh, you, you start checking the boxes on some good things for indoor air quality. Uh, HVAC is, is correctly sized, for example. Uh, there's, there's ventilation requirements in Energy Star. And then Indoor Air Plus builds upon Energy Star, and it adds uh, provisions for these other items that are listed here that I'll quickly walk through so you get a sense of what they encompass. So for projects located in Radon Zone 1, and I'll show the map here in a moment, uh, these radon-resistant construction measures are required, and they're, they're illustrated here. They're fairly basic. It's or Essentially, this is a passive uh, radon mitigation system. And a number of these items we mentioned, are, you're also going to want to do them for moisture control. Uh, radon test kits are not required. And one other thing I'll mention on the radon is that the Indoor Air Plus uh, program docs they actually reference a multifamily design standard for radon uh, so that some of the, the questions that pop up on radon mitigation systems for, for multifamily are addressed in that document. So it's a good resource to be aware of. And as we can see, the, the zone one counties based on the EPA radon zone map uh, are the darker red ones. And it looks like Virginia does have some counties in that radon zone. So this is something to keep an eye out. Uh, during the design phase. Moving on in the indoor air plus program requirements, uh, screened openings to prevent pest intrusion. This, this is basically built into the code, but it's called out in indoor air plus because it's an important measure and you get that accountability that someone's looking for this item and checking, off, checking it off on the list. Low emission materials is, uh, is it really critical element of Indoor Air Plus. You know, we're building these dwellings tighter and tighter, and that's great for energy efficiency, and it's good for comfort. We don't have draftiness. Uh, on the, at the same time, though, we need to be mindful of what kinds of materials we're putting into the, to the units, and if they're off-gassing a lot of harmful pollutants, uh, we want to avoid that. So the good news is there's a huge variety and array of low-emission products 
out there in the marketplace now, and they're recognized by uh, a number of different third-party labels and certifications. Like up here, we have the Kitchen Cabinet Manufacturers Association. Uh, CRI has labeling for uh, carpets and padding. So within the Indoor Air Plus program, they, they focus on four different categories of products that you see here, the cabinets, the pressed wood, paints, and carpets. But there is a lot of jargon. There's a lot of third-party certs. Uh, so several years ago, uh, we worked with Indoor Air Plus, and they generated like a little cheat sheet, uh, which is shown here. It's a really nice resource available on their site, and it's a great guide to what do you need to, to list in your, in your specification requirements for the carpeting, for the kitchen cabinets, et cetera. Um, so there's lots of these products out there, and this is a nice little guide to how to specify them uh, without having to, to learn everything from scratch. Indoor Air Plus also requires uh, CO alarms and policies for environmental tobacco smoke in the public areas of multifamily. Uh, on the CO alarms, these are, again, these are just code, code minimum requirements, but they're bundled into Indoor Air Plus because of their importance. Uh, we often will call the duct system of a, of a house the lungs of the home, so we want to keep those lungs out of garages where they might entrain uh, pollutants and spread them into the living space. This particular house has really big lungs, and we want to keep them out of the garage. Uh, building cavity ducts, I would guess they've been restricted um, by Virginia's Energy Code for quite some time. Um, but just in case, they are also uh, uh, prohibited for use based on Indoor Air Plus. High capture filtration, uh, Indoor Air Plus, and therefore the Zero Ready program require at least a MERV-8 filter for the central HVAC system. Uh, this value will be moving up in the not too distant future to something closer to 13, but right now it's still at eight. So that is a real quick tour through the indoor air quality provisions that are part of Zero Ready. And the next item uh, we'll move up to is the energy efficient components. And so we, we tee up this discussion by simply recognizing buildings that might've been built 10, 15, 20 years ago used a lot more energy. And a big slice of that energy, more than half, was typically heating and cooling. And now dwellings based on just minimum energy code and then more, more advanced programs are using less energy. But we've seen this shift to where the heating and cooling, because of better insulation, better air sealing, that, that portion of the overall budget has shrunk. And you have these other components like lighting, appliances, hot water, and plug-in loads becoming a bigger, uh, bigger piece of the, pu of the puzzle. So from the Zero Ready Home requirements, uh, we have this laundry list of, of Energy Star appliance requirements. So it's refrigerators, dishwashers, clothes washers, and you notice the asterisk uh, where installed by the builder. Uh, Energy Star certified fans. Uh, the bath fan, I always point out, is a more efficient fan, so you save some energy, but it, uh, Energy Star fans also have a sound requirement, so it, it's got to be relatively quiet, which I think is a is a beneficial thing for moisture control and the fan actually getting used. At least 80% of the lighting has to be Energy Star certified, CFL or LED. And then we have a couple different options to make hot water systems efficient. You can do one or the other, A or B. The first option, A, is listed out here. It focuses on the plumbing layout. And the thing we want to avoid is having like a mile of plumbing between the water heater and the furthest fixture because you waste a lot of energy, you waste a lot of water with that kind of a layout. Um, I won't go into the details here, so we can keep it moving, but these are spelled out in the program specs. Basically, the, the design pathways that allow our partners to achieve an efficient hot water layout are listed here. It's either a wet wall, a smaller diameter manifold home run type of system, or an on-demand pumping system. All three of those reduce the amount of stored hot water we have between our hot water source and our fixtures. And in the multifamily setting, if it's a central system, there are some specific provisions for how that on-demand research for that central system should work. And they're, they're noted here. That was option A. Option B, uh, we don't focus as much on the distribution. Instead, let's get the water heater itself to be efficient. So if it's gas, that's going to mean a tankless. If it's electric, it's going to be the heat pump water heater. Let's make the the fixtures themselves efficient, so we have water sense shower heads and bath, bathroom sink faucets. 
And then there is a backstop to stored hot water volume and the piping between the, the hot water source and the fixture can be no long, uh, no more than 1.2 gallons. That, that's a decent distribution system. That's not that hard to achieve. So that's the A or B on getting efficient hot water within the units. And the last item I'll mention is the solar readiness component of zero energy ready homes. So it's about a half dozen measures that set up a home or a dwelling unit to more easily accommodate solar at some point in the future. It's documentation of the roof load ratings. It's running conduit from the, the roof area down to the area of the electric service panel. It's dedicating some area around that panel for a future inverter. And it's reserving some space within the panel itself to tie in a PV system in the future. So that's the collection of provisions. There are several allowances which may indicate whether they're required or simply encouraged. So the first one I want to mention is this map of solar resources you see here. The way it works is you'll there's a website listed in our program specs. You plug in your zip, you go to the website, it's a NREL website. Plug in your zip code, you go through a few steps, you see what your annual solar resources for the project site look like on this scale. And if you're above five, then zero ready uh, PV ready provisions are required. If not, they're encouraged. So that's one item. We also want to point out that maybe you are in a sunny area, but there's significant shading, uh, there's tall buildings, or the building is simply not oriented in a way that provides enough south-facing roof area. Uh, all three of these are recognized as allowances in, in our specs. And on that roof area one, there's actually like a little table with minimum square footage values. If you fall short of those, uh, the project would not have to implement the PV ready features. It could still, however, qualify for the program. Another key point on multifamily is that not each and every dwelling unit must be made PV ready. Uh, that's an option, or the, the common space electrical service can be made PV ready. So a few nuances to note how PV ready would apply to multifamily. And I'll just take a few minutes here to wrap it up. Uh, as Dan noted, the there are some other green building certification requirements involved in the high e program and i just wanted to share a couple slides quickly i won't go into the details but the main takeaway is that there's a good bundle of points for zero ready within enterprise green communities and their 2020 uh, guidelines and you can see some of the details here and we'll share these slides and the same is also true uh, on lead for homes version 4 as you might imagine, there's a significant amount of overlap, and LEED has actually issued this interpretation ID listed down here at the bottom, which explains in more detail how certifying as zero ready checks the box on quite a few of the points required for LEED, including uh, many of the prerequisites in the energy and atmosphere, as well as the indoor, indoor environmental quality sections. So just file those away. And then it's just a few steps. Uh, few, few points on getting started will often get questions. Well, you know, how do I get involved? How does a pro project get certified? It's important to note that developers, builders that are already working with the Energy Star program, there's a whole lot of symmetry with zero energy ready home. It's, it's generally going to be the same radar network, the same modeling software, and the same process of plan review, modeling, and site inspections. So there's a really good head start for project teams that are already familiar with working in the Energy Star environment. And then as far as becoming a partner and getting started, uh, there's an online partnership agreement. If builders and developers are looking for verifier partners, uh, we have a listing of verifier partners at the Zero Ready website. Uh, you can go there to check out some possibilities. There's no pre-registration of projects, no program certification fees. Uh, We've seen a lot of success in our partners that use an integrated design process where they bring in the trades earlier on. Then that, that Raider verifier does the plan review and site inspections. Actual project certification is generated by the Energy Raider's modeling software once it, it's uploaded uh, to the ResNet building registry. And then builders are credited with the certified homes that they, that they accrue on the DOE website. And from there, uh, Builders can participate in the annual awards program and really leverage a lot of recognition opportunities. Um, we can have that discussion on a different day. So with that, I'll just leave it off with the website. I think one of the 
key resources here this group might be interested in is taking a look at the program specifications. They're listed there. You can become a partner. You can see literally hundreds of project examples. Each of them has a profile on the DOE Tour Zero, uh, the marketing toolkit, and a whole host of recorded webinars. So with that, I will stop sharing, Dan, if that sounds good. And I'll hand it over to Matt Waring of Radiant, who's going to cover the uh, requirements that pertain to substantial rehabs and adaptive reuse projects. That's right. Thank you, Jamie. Fantastic. Um, Matt, the floor is yours. All right. One second. Just need to share. I think I shared one. Jamie was still sharing. <clears throat> Share my entire screen and then so you might all see yourselves quickly. <clears throat> uh, all right, do you have my slides then? Yep, Matt, it's come up. Yep. Okay. Oh, it's, oh we sorry. lost. <clears throat> sorry, we lost that. Yeah. I didn't want everybody to see the. Uh... I'm sorry. What's it down here? Didn't want everybody to see this button. All right, cool. Um, here we are. Thank you. I have that. I know I'm sharing. All right. Can you see him again? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, Jamie, thanks so much. That was an excellent presentation. Uh, it was really helpful for me as well as a reader. So um, I really enjoyed that. And uh, I appreciate you all having me, Dan. Thank you for having me today. Uh, I'm Matt Waring. I'm with Viridian. Um, I've been with the organization uh, since 2011. Uh, we, uh, the organization Viridian, in its former iteration, Earthcraft Virginia, was around uh, since 2000, has been around since 2006. Um, I've been a Raider since 2011 when I joined the organization, um, initially started in the multifamily side and uh, have kind of worked to be helping manage the project managers in that in that department as well as our technical advisors out in the field. Um, definitely spent some time swinging a hammer uh, as a young man. I'm glad I don't have to do that any longer, but uh, I think it helped uh, kind of day to day. Um, was a ResNet QAD, so that's just a little bit about me. Um, so I'm going, to, I'm going to jump right into the requirements here so I don't waste any time. I'm going to go back over some of the requirements that Dan listed in the, uh, in the front end of the presentation, uh, having to do with kind of the alignment between the QAP, the LATAC QAP, uh, and the high E funds. Um, so I'll just kind of compare those and talk about some of the, some of the, uh, the highlights, I guess, um, and some of the things that we as Raiders focus on when we go through this pr uh, process, especially analyzing and kind of trying to get in and on site uh, to these rehab projects, which uh, pose a whole different set of uh, kind of problems and logistical hurdles uh, when we're talking about trying to really get deep energy retrofits um, into these buildings and spaces. So, um, so based on QAP requirements, quickly just to go back over them, uh, if you're if you're trying to get uh, either four percent or nine percent funding uh, through uh, through the VHDA or Virginia Housing, apologies, it's going to take me five years to, to correct that uh, through Virginia Housing. Uh, uh, as part of their uh, competitive or non-competitive process, uh, as a renovation, your baseline uh, requirements are either a 30% improvement in the HERS index over the existing conditions. Uh, I think it's a weighted average of HERS 80 across the uh, entire development. And if you're adaptive reuse, you're looking for less than or equal to a HERS of 95. Uh, across the, de the development. Um, so uh, I think very smartly, uh, the high E funds have really kind of mirrored that uh, and just taken it, you know, in a very similar stair step fashion to the way uh, Zero Energy Ready Homes, I'm sorry, I have like some sort of timer on these apparently. Uh, the way Zero Energy Ready has kind of stair stepped above uh, Energy Star, very similarly, we have just kind of stair stepped above those Virginia housing requirements here. So um, requiring a 40% improvement in HERS or less than or equal to a 70 across all units uh, based on the where the wording is. So um, that means every unit in the development has to be 70 or less HERS. And for adaptive reuse, uh, then we're looking at an 80. So um, definitely an increase there um, in both categories uh, in efficiency and stringency. 
Um, and that level of 40% obviously is a, is a pretty drastic step up in overall efficiency of the development. Um, so just quickly going to go through some of these requirements, talk to you about, uh, talk to you about these requirements, and then I'll go into kind of how we have handled these on our end um, as we've been getting inquiries in these first couple rounds. Um, so, you know, that optional QAP um, points are, you know, you can get a 10 additional points on the current application for pursuing one of the green building programs. Um, and HIE has mirrored that as well, calling out the very same or similar green building programs um, and uh, for renovation. Uh, so I think that was, I think that was smart. I'm sorry about the um, auto advance here. That was uh, something I should have checked. Uh, so uh, interestingly, I think, uh, I think that makes a lot of sense to just kind of tack on um, and mandate this. We've seen a lot of projects come through in the renovation realm uh, in the past couple of years that are only only really pursuing that hers 80 that kind of very baseline level uh for virginia housing and so it's smart to just kind of really care at people down the road to get this additional step this uh, additional green building program and so you have options there it's not one option uh we obviously prefer a craft in house uh, and so i'm going to go ahead and just state my bias there uh, as that goes but we really prefer if there's a lot of alignment with the kind of initial qap baseline requirements at the goal level uh, Earthcraft requires 20% at the certified level, 30% and 40% improvement at the platinum level. So working up uh, in, in um, stringency and efficiency and improvement over the existing conditions in the different levels. Um, uh, NGBS similarly uh, has a a kind of a range in their in their levels, uh, the highest being their emerald level, um, but they're looking for a range from 15 to 45 percent improvement over the existing conditions, depending on which level you're pursuing there. Uh, Enterprise uh, is really looking for a HERS 80. Uh, they also have some less stringent requirements for things with uh, like full masonry, exterior walls, uh, wall assemblies. So, um, you know, full width brick and things of that nature. They actually have a little less stringent requirements, closer to 100 uh, HERS index. And then there are pathways through lead as well. Um, so we we see all of these. We've seen all of these coming down the pipe, and we are agnostic as far as that goes. We love uh, any program that kind of, uh, you know, rising tide floats all boats. Um, and so we really like uh, helping you kind of execute on any of these, these pathways. We're obviously most familiar with the Earthcraft pathway, and I personally am as well. Um, we see that fairly often. Um, so these all have points, items, and requirements that are go uh, on top of just that uh, you know, additional uh, efficiency required by the actual program. There are going to be points, items, and other requirements within all of these programs that you will have to achieve to get the baseline certification. Um, and so that's something important to remember. These may, well, while maybe the high E funding doesn't have specific requirements or avoid some specific requirements, these green building programs may come up and kind of buttress uh, the high E funding requirements. So uh, it's something to think about, something I'll hit on as we kind of work through here. So uh, let's talk about everything that's kind of called out as, as you work through some of these high requirements um, in the table that they provide, which I think is super helpful. Um, so uh, firstly, we, they re, they're going to require a manual J. So just going the HERS 80 path through Virginia housing does not require that you get load sizing or load calculations performed. Um, there's no requirement there for that. So uh, it's a nice step in the right direction to say, okay, well, let's make sure we're right sizing. We're not just one-to-one -one changing out uh, uh, units. We see uh, oversizing, drastic oversizing all the time. Uh, and so it doesn't make a lot of sense to assume that the sizing that's gone into this rehab was correct the first time. Um, you know, we see a new construction uh, typically in the eight to 1100 square feet per ton range. We'll often find much, much lower square feet per ton range uh, in installed equipment in the field uh, in, in existing projects. We also see it specified in new construction projects as well. So, and I'll show you an example of that. So we're, we're, when we look at one of these HVAC loads, we, what we really wanna see is just that the existing conditions are being taken into account. Now this is a pull out from a new construction project, but uh, so you can see there are some pretty nice walls and roof assemblies and things of that nature, but um, we will look and you know, your, your raters should be looking to ensure that the actual components used to create these load calcs are what are reflecting the actual uh, the actual dwelling unit for which they're being created. So uh, we don't want to see eight people in a, in a three bedroom apartment. This is a three bedroom unit. Uh, and so there are four people, uh, as you can see kind of down here and really highlighted where we have people. Uh, there are equipment, there, there are internal gains, there are actual UNSHC values for the planned renovation. So we really want to see all of this taken into account um, when we're providing these. And so we want to make sure that we're right sizing these units as they go back in. It's a, it's a really hard thing to curb energy use overall. Uh, when we don't start with one of the largest energy using systems in the in the space uh, and get that right right off the rip, um, so we have a lot of we have a lot of back and forth with these items on uh, on on typical new construction projects uh, and so getting them kind of completed for reno jobs I think is a nice step in the right direction it makes a lot of sense um, and so we again 
getting right sized equipment not only helps uh, curb energy use, but also improves humidity control in the space as well. Um, this is just a quick example from a new construction project, so I can show you kind of what we see uh, day to day. Um, this is a one bedroom unit, about 765 square feet, and this is what it's calling out, about 1,000 CFM. Uh, in this unit. So uh, that's 306 square feet per ton. Uh, and a one and a half ton unit is 510 square feet per ton. So the smallest nominal size you can get in a standard piece of equipment, you can see very clearly that that is well below that 900 square feet per ton that we were looking for uh, in a new construction project. So if you can imagine that a rehab, uh, we could have people very drastically oversizing um, for these dwelling units, uh, maybe unnecessarily, especially when we know that we're gonna be curbing things like envelope leakage, duct leakage, uh, things of that nature. So, um, so additionally, uh, there is a requirement for fresh air ventilation. Uh, for renovations and adaptive reuse projects, uh, if a building unit uh, is tightened up to the point where it's hitting that 5 ACH 50 level, a uh, ventilation system's gonna have to be provided. Um, and so uh, that has, that requires that it is not, an, and we're not talking about an opening opening of a window necessarily. Uh, we want a system that is, um, that is really uh, out of the tenant's hands to control, runs once every three hours to be really considered fresh air, mechanical ventilation, um, and is using an intended pathway. Uh, typically what we want to see is, uh, is really intentional fresh air ventilation. Um, and so that's, uh, that's a big change for a lot of projects. Um, I mean, it's a big change for new construction single family homes in the state right now that are going through kind of the code change and the update to the 2015 IACC. So, uh, you know, it is very unlikely to find an existing fresh air system in a reno project. And those can be challenging. They're going to require additional penetrations in the unit envelopes or the building envelopes. Um, and so, you know, they've called out some levels here, 62.2 versus 62.1, depending on uh, your code and building type uh, to, be con to be considered. And they want the more stringent uh, of those so to get these funds. So right here, I'm just showing a bath fan, a standard bath fan, a standard kind of air cycler uh, G2K system, actually, by the, by, it's a, an air cycler is a, both a brand and a piece of equipment. Um, and, uh, and then just an ERV. So, so all these options work to satisfy that. There are also some options for large central dedicated outdoor air systems that have to be uh, provided. Um, now, dehumidification is also a requirement of the program. It does not have any sort of caveat around building tightness. Uh, so they, we want to see dehumidification here. Um, the one thing to note about the fresh air ventilation is that many of your green building programs will require fresh air ventilation. So even if you're aiming at 7 ACH 50, maybe not that 5 ACH 50, the green building program you're pursuing they would then still require fresh air ventilation. So, uh, you know, in order to meet all of the marks, uh, a little bit of an exercise in hoop jumping, but, um, you know, to and your herd rater can help you kind of align all of these goals uh, as well, your rater or your plan review or whoever you're working with uh, as, a, as a kind of green consultant. But, um, you know, very important to understand both the requirements of your green building program that you're going to plan to participate in as well as uh, the high funding requirements here. So, um, so, and they are different, right? And they will have uh, different mandates. So, uh, but dehumidification strategy, uh, this is something that can be challenging depending on existing conditions. We've seen a lot of different ways to do this. Um, and and uh, Virginia Housing has classically allowed uh, this, this kind of dedicated outdoor air system with a tempered dehumidified air being delivered to the dwelling units to uh, achieve this for their funding purposes. And it looks like as long as we can maintain that 40 to 60% range, uh, we should be fine uh, by utilizing that exact same system uh, through the high E funding. So if you're building type, uh, lends itself to this type of system and you don't mind having the fresh air ventilation or the dehumidification being on the owner's dime, which is definitely a consideration versus a distributed individual systems, uh, you know, that's definitely an option for you as well. Uh, In-wall units are becoming more and more prevalent. Uh, there are a couple manufacturers out there, Ultra Air, uh, Innovative are both doing it. Um, uh, and they have really good 16 inch on center uh, retrofit type, ap type applications. They can be flush mounted uh, like you see here in the bottom right or you know, mounted actually onto the wall if it's like a block wall uh, of some sort. So they have a bunch of different mounting options uh, and they fit really well into these small multifamily units and they're right sized as far as their moisture removal for small multifamily units. Um, you will have to get to duct testing. So this is something I definitely wanted to hit on as much as I possibly could in the time allowed here. So, uh, you know, it, this is a black box for all of our rehab jobs is the duct performance. Uh, there are pathways here that would allow us to not get on site and still provide you with the HERS rating uh, until the back end, until really we are at the, uh, 
until really we are at the back end of uh, on, on testing. So like if we're on the in final testing, we're testing duck leakage and we're finding exorbitant levels of duck leakage, well, that's going to be a hindrance to you hitting your 40% improvement. Um, so it makes a lot of sense to get us out there early and often to get these ducks tested on the front end uh, so we can really get an understanding. And that's why this percentage improvement uh, over existing conditions make a lot of sense. It requires us to get out on site and do a, an existing baseline condition inspection, right? Understand exactly what the conditions are out there on site and then provide you better, more uh, honed feedback um, as to what your scope should or could be on the back end. This is just an example of a project that we used uh, for, um, uh, or that we did uh, preliminary duct leakage on five units, uh, I'm sorry, seven units. Uh, and you can see, um, you know, the tested leakage to out and uh, the tested total in an existing uh, project being exorbitantly high. I mean, one of these were showing 900 CFMs worth of duct leakage. All of these were uh, above 200. Uh, in the total duct leakage realm. So that's going to be well above the 10% that's required by the high E funding. Um, and these are things that can really hurt you on the back end uh, if we don't, if we can't get in front of the, the issue. Um, so, uh, and often duct systems are just not, maybe not ignored, but inaccessible. And so have not been addressed. And in our typical rehabs, a lot of them are not addressed. So, um, so, you know, this is just to point out how drastic duct leakage can be with disconnected ducts behind bulkheads and things of that nature that we really can't see otherwise. Uh, you need to get a plan review and a preliminary rating. That's something that we provide all the time uh, and that, you know, we, we really have since probably 2013 thought that it's an extremely important thing to get in front of teams as early as, as, early as possible and provide preliminary home energy rating scores or HERS rating um, so that we can tell you exactly where you stand and then give you sort of a roadmap, something to keep you between the ditches for what your scope development should look like. Um, we often see VE kind of between this pre-review and actual construction, and that's where things get lost in the shuffle. Um, but uh, but I'll tell you, it's um, it's definitely uh, it's definitely I think a very important step. I know Passive House and some of the other programs uh, are also offering a very similar service where they pre kind of uh, pre certify your project, making sure you're on the right path forward. Um, and so it's a great step that Heidi has, has required as part of this process. Uh, and just another couple of considerations here for getting on site that we think make a lot of sense. Uh, you know, these are things that are hidden behind several layers of building materials. Uh, right here, you're just looking at a thermal image of us running the blower door and sucking in a whole bunch of cold air uh, through kind of drop ceiling tiles. Um, and, you know, we never would have known that this condition existed until we started running the blower door, really seeing high leakage numbers, getting the IR gun on it, and then kind of tracking it back down um, to this knee wall area that was pretty much wide open to the space. So these things are, are not accessible. They're not obvious on drawings, but when we get out there and start running blower doors and really pulling on these units, we can actually find these things. Um, and so it makes it even more important to really get out on site and get eyes on them. Um, even though, again, there are pathways through this through these programs that allow you to maybe avoid that kind of upfront testing, avoid some cost. There's a lot of things that uh, these things really just help help eliminate the variables uh, on the back end. Um, and then uh, last thing I'll kind of hit on quickly here because I know we're running up against it, but uh, operations and maintenance. We are uh, by by moving existing buildings and changing the way they perform, you know, increasing their performance by 40%, we're fundamentally changing the physics of how these buildings work. Um, and so we may, while, you know, the drying potential of the building may have maybe lessened by tightening up the envelope, we're going to become more heavily reliant on the systems in that building to actually uh, control things like humidity. So if your bath van has birds living in it, uh, you're not going to have great bath van, bath ventilation uh, out of your out of your actual units. And therefore, you could get moisture buildup in that space, especially if we're then taking it down to like a 5 ACH 50 realm or below. Um, so uh, high performance buildings just need careful, consistent maintenance. And we, you know, we are changing the way these buildings operate fundamentally. Um, that's something that we have to keep in mind as we as we really kind of tighten down on them um, from an envelope perspective, a duct perspective. Um, we have to be very careful about that. Quickly, uh, just just to hit on this, this is just something that we provided, just showing kind of where hers some some hers uh, started, and then individual measures and how they affect the actual overall her score. Not only that, but how they affect the uh, kind of annual annual energy costs. Um, one thing I'll just note here is you can see fresh air ventilation is actually an energy penalty for us. Uh, it's, it's for the health and safety of the occupants. It's not for uh, the energy use of the building, right? It's for good indoor air quality for the, for the tenants. But what we can do is run scenarios here that uh, allow us to focus in on um, some of the most cost effective items that really improve the energy efficiency uh, and bring down that kind of or increase the kind of percentage improvement overall from front to back on the problem.
on that project. So this is just quickly for you. I'm sure you all can see this in your in your language, uh, but uh, just what's the carrot here? They're carrying you down the road. They're trying to bring you down the road to get to these better performing buildings. Uh, you get better IQ and health for the tenants, uh, utility allowance incentives uh, in addition uh, to that, so we can help you pr uh, re, re recoup some of your money basically uh, through utility allowances, uh, Verdian and there's several, several other people who provide utility allowances for these type of projects that you can um, you can really capitalize on as well. Uh, so as you improve their uh, performance, you can really uh, capitalize on that and recoup some of your investment. So that is, uh, that is it uh, for me and I'm, uh, I'm going to stop presenting. I know I'm running right up against time here, Dan. So uh, try to jump through that. I hope that was informative. Um, I'll just stop talking. Yep. Yeah, that was that was great, Matt. And um, you and Jamie had a lot for us, and it was it was excellent. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, I think Jamie was actually able to respond to a couple of questions um, in real time. Um, that, and so thank you, Jamie, for doing that. And I think there was a question about tankless um, electric water heaters that would meet the ZERH requirements. Um, Jamie, do you have any light you can shed on that for us? So I, I missed that in the chat, Dan. Uh, regarding tankless electric water heaters, uh, there's two observations on that. They're not prohibited. There's no must-do mandatory water heater requirement in our specs. You might recall I showed A or B. You could focus on hot water distribution or focus on the water heater and water sense fixtures. So uh, that second option would be off the table if a unit is using an electric tankless. It's not going to be as efficient as the program would require. You could focus, you could use the electric tankless, tankless and focus on the distribution piece and, and, and meet that spec. Um, the only thing you'd be left with is the energy performance of a tankless is going to trail what you'd get um, with something like a heat pump water heater. So likely you'd, you'd have to make up some HERS points elsewhere in the design. It's feasible to do it. You would just have to do a little extra legwork to make it work. Great, thanks, thanks, Jamie. Uh, I think there was a well, there was just a clarification about enter, enterprise green communities um, requirements there for uh, points. Um, so thanks. They were for, right, actually. Yeah, we I don't know if we got that wrong or we looked at a draft, but yeah, it's it's forty optional points. So okay. it already still delivers a lot of overlapping credits, and it's against the backdrop of needing forty additional points. All right. So uh, there is a question here um, regarding uh, is the renter only eligible for the program if the owner of their unit authorizes the weatherization work? Just to clarify, we're um, we're talking about substantial renovation and adaptive reuse projects. So these are um, deeper energy retrofits than are typically done by um, the weatherization program. Um, so I don't, I don't know, Matt, I, I would imagine there is some sort of tenant approval process or owner approval process for any kind of project that's undergoing a, 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 a substantial renovation. Um, yeah, absolutely. I'm, uh, I'm not exactly sure what that entails. Um, and I do know that, uh, you know, when, whenever trying to get uh, tenant data back out, so, you know, performance data, um, there is quite a bit of, uh, of, of form requirements and acceptance of that uh, whenever we're trying to get that performance data on the back end. So uh, I'm unsure how, what uh, steps actually have to be taken to remove, like move tenants out uh, or, or you know, do a tenant in place rehab. Yeah. Okay. Well, we can follow up on that question. Just I think the, 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 um, the concern is regarding raising of rents. But um, again, since most of these projects are um, permanently affordable housing, um, you know, there are some covenants with regard to uh, rents uh, that are in place. So I think we can follow up and get more information. So um, in the interest of time, we are after one o'clock. Um, Jamie or Matt, are you available to have stay on for a little more live Q&A? Yes. Okay. Okay. So um, we've, folks, um, for those of you who do need to drop off for one o'clock engagements, um, please feel free to do so. Um, we're happy to stay on the line. Thanks everyone that attended. I think our attendance here was well up above 100, which was way beyond what our expectations were. So we really appreciate the, the, the interest and, um, and um, we appreciate Matt and Jamie taking the time to really do a deep dive for us on the technical requirements. Um, so I think we've covered everything that's in the chat. Um, if there are any uh, 
questions that you have for Jamie and Matt, um, feel free to unmute yourself and hop on the call. And we'll, we'll take a couple more questions here and then we'll wrap up for the day. Uh, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Matt and Jamie. I did have a question for Matt. You made a comment about taking the ventilation out of the hands of the tenants. And I just wanted to get some background of what helped you come to that policy decision. Yeah, that's a great question. So that's not a policy decision. Uh, that is, uh, it's really a, a logistical setup issue. So, uh, and it's not out of their hands from a decision making process, really. Uh, though I guess it is in some ways. But the, what my intent there was actually to say that uh, you can't rely on the tenant to operate the fresh air ventilation. So you can't rely on a tenant to say, okay, I want fresh air ventilation now and turn it on. It has to automatically operate outside of tenant control uh, or outside of homeowner interaction control. So even if you were a single family home, homeowner and you had fresh air ventilation in your home, you wouldn't ever, you don't have any way of knowing when your home needs fresh air ventilation. It needs to op operate automatically on a timer to ensure that we get that fresh air ventilation. Um, if you look at kind of commer more commercial type buildings, they actually operate on like a carbon carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, they monitor carbon dioxide in the space. So if there's lots of people moving around in the space and, you know, exhaling carbon dioxide goes up and then they increase right. the ventilation rates. So uh, unfortunately, code right now requires that single family and really residential operate more on a fixed schedule rather than uh, kind of adapting to the different uh, environmental needs of the home. So uh, there's no one size fits all, I don't think, for ventilation uh, in general, but uh, that is just sort of the way the code comes downhill at us. Okay. okay. Thank okay. you, Matt. Yeah, I no problem. It. I that answered answer that. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Any other questions while we've got Matt and Jamie um, at our disposal here? Last chance to pick their brains for today. <laughs> There's some other questions in the chat. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, solar um, AV to your question. Um, the high E funds are not available for solar. They're they're um, for energy efficiency only, and that's per the statute. Um, so we we think there are going to be some options coming online for shared solar, community solar, uh, for affordable housing here in the next year or so. Um, Let's see, uh, Stu had the question, a recorded presentation, yes sir, will be available. Um, don't know anything about the Barney Frank Relocation Act. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, my name's Judy, I have a question. I know maintenance is a big deal to yes. make sure all the high tech stuff you're doing works. Are there any program requirements for maintenance? Or education to the occupants, yeah. We, Judy, to your question, we have not written anything in above and beyond what's what's already required for the the LIHTC, um program in terms of occupant education. On this, it, it is a very good point. Um, it's something that we should take into consideration going forward. Um, so, um, if you have any suggestions, um, please please feel free to reach out to us. But yes, we should we should definitely re revisit that issue as we as we sort of move forward with this. All right, I think we're going to wrap it up for today, folks. I um, appreciate everybody staying on the line, Jamie and Matt. Um, greatly appreciate your time and expertise. Um, we'll get the slides and the recording out to you all. Um, and thanks again, everybody, for joining. Um, stay safe out there. Um, hopefully, the rest of